Begin with sin. Here we go. All right. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. God's grace and peace be with all of you. As we begin this morning, just a quick reminder, whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary, you're joining us via live stream, uh, please remember to go to the church's website, fccbrla.org. Uh, there you will find links for uh, giving. You will find links for this morning. Uh, on our uh, bulletin information this morning, you can also on that page put your name, your family name in to log your attendance. And if you have a special prayer request, uh, fill out the form there, submit that, and uh, I will read those out just before our prayer time together. Uh, with those initial announcements given, I would like to turn it over to Aaron with our prelude. Thank you, Aaron. That was wonderful. Uh, as you notice, uh, Joao is not with us this morning. He's uh, doing a uh, kind of an online recital. So uh, we have Aaron this morning, and then uh, for uh, singing for us this morning is Rebecca Alfonso. Rebecca, thank you so much for leading us in music this morning. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Wednesday Bible study is at 1 p.m., uh, nursery has not reopened yet, but uh, we do have a live stream in our library over here to my right if you need to step out at all. Uh, and fine, oh, uh, we also, here's the fun part, we have a gas leak somewhere on campus that we're trying to track down and uh, part of uh, trying to figure out where our gas lines are, uh, we need to lift up the island in the fellowship hall. So following service this morning, if we have some strong arms and some strong backs, uh, could join Charles over in the fellowship hall. Uh, we just want to get a peek under the island to see if we can figure out where uh, an old gas line might terminate. So uh, following service, again, uh, if there's a few uh, folks could uh, join together in the fellowship hall for that little project. Uh, one uh, final question for us as we come into worship today. Uh, something to keep in mind as we worship together. What is the place of worship in your life? Uh, what does worship mean to you? How do you engage with God in worship? What role does worship play for you in your Christian walk? With those announcements given, I'd like to ask Lisa, would you please come and lead us in the call to worship? I want to ask all of us, please rise as you are able.
Good morning. We come here shouting, our voices lifted in praise. We come here singing, our songs full of joy. We come here dancing, our hearts rejoicing. To the Holy One who is worthy, all praise and glory forevermore. Please join me in our hymn of praise. confess that our faithfulness to you, our obedience to your calling, our righteousness is not steadfast and true. In living out our praise, we too easily falter after the first page. Were it not for the lavish gift of your Son, we would be lost. Through him, we turn to you in our hearts, knowing your steadfast love and faithfulness, your righteousness and peace. In him, your salvation is at hand. May this worship reflect your goodness as we respond to you with our heart, soul, and mind. Make a path in the middle of this congregation today and walk among us through your Holy Spirit. This we pray in the name of the one who is your peace, your salvation. Let us also pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Adapted reading from Psalm 85. I will listen to you, Lord God, because you promise peace to those who are faithful and no longer foolish. 
You are ready to rescue everyone who worships you, so that you will live with us in all of your glory. Love and loyalty will come together, and goodness and peace will unite. Loyalty will sprout from the ground, justice will look down from the sky above. Our Lord, you will bless us. Our land will produce wonderful crops. Justice will march in front, making a path for you to follow. So, you know how when you go to the doctor and they take that instrument out of the refrigerator and touch it to your chest, that stethoscope thing? <laughs> well, they're listening to your heart, and sometimes they don't like what they hear, and they have to give you medicine, or sometimes even a new heart. But um, it's important to know, you know, if your heart's not working, if there's... If, Something's wrong with it. So um, in one of our scriptures today, you'll hear about King David, who had a really special relationship with God. He, um, you know, when, even when he was a shepherd boy, um, God chose him to be a, a king. And then God helped him defeat Goliath. And there was even one story in the Bible where David was so joyful about his relationship with God that he took off all his clothes and danced for God. But at one point, David had problems with his heart. He had something evil in his heart. He did something wrong. And God became very unhappy with him. And God sent a man named Nathan to visit with David and tell him that he had done something wrong and God was not happy. And I don't know about you, but if I were Nathan, I'd be kind of scared to have to go tell the king that. But he did. And instead of getting mad at Nathan, David turned to God and he prayed and he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And um, God healed David's heart. So let's, you know, we, sometimes we have bad things in our hearts too, you know, like selfishness or greed or pride and we need to pray to God and ask him to take those things out of our hearts. So let's, let's pray now and ask God to do that. Our Father, we ask you to create in us a clean heart and remove any of those things that might displease you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We gather our hearts in prayer, a number of folks to keep in mind. Uh, Jeffrey Judice, as we shared last week, uh, he's dealing with cancer in his throat. Uh, they've done some more tests. They've determined that he's going to need both radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, but the prognosis is good. There's a good feeling that these treatments will be successful. However, as you can imagine, uh, anything dealing with that part of your body, it's just uncomfortable, whatever the procedure is. So uh, please keep Jeffrey and Tony and all of their family in their prayers as Jeffrey goes through this difficult time. Uh, Ann Landry uh, has been having some tests for some spinal issues, so we keep her in our prayers. Uh, Tom, Cody's brother, uh, Jimmy, uh, was in the hospital, uh, so we keep Jimmy in our prayers. Uh, Amy uh, uh, Zitlow, I'd hope, did I say that correctly? Zitlow, uh, sorry. Amy Zitlow, uh, this is Reverend Michael Karunas' wife. Uh, she's been dealing with breast cancer. She begins chemotherapy this week. Please keep Amy in your prayers. Uh, Scott Sanders, uh, Linda Sanders' husband, he's been dealing with, with plantar fasciitis in both of his legs and uh, is looking to surgery on one of them here. So he's having a very tough time. So we keep Scott in our prayers. Uh, we also uh, found out through the community grapevine that Matt Rink, Flo Rink's son, uh, is dealing with cancer. Uh, please keep Matt in your prayers. Um, Announcement came through that uh, Reverend Monty Gravenstein, who is a minister here at Baton Rouge in the 1980s, uh, he passed away on June 29th. I believe he was 85 years old. Uh, he was living in the Kansas City area. Uh, we keep the family of John Durham in our prayers. Uh, this is a friend of Mike, uh, I'm sorry, Frank Dickinson and also uh, the Stills as well. Uh, he was on our prayer list for quite a while and he passed away this last week. Uh, some con congratulations to pass along Charlene Landry celebrating a birthday. Charlene, it's good to see you this morning. Happy birthday. And also Marie La Ladner is happy to welcome a great granddaughter, uh, Kaylee Ann, born to her granddaughter Jessica and husband Sean, uh, seven pounds, eight ounces, and 20, 20 inches long. So congratulations to Marie and her family. I believe those are all of our joys and concerns. Let us now join together in prayer together. God of all blessings and source of all life, giver of grace, we thank you for the gift of life, for breath that sustains us, for food that nurtures life, and for the love of family and friends without which there would be no life. We thank you for the mystery of creation, for the beauty that no eye can see, for the joy that no ear may hear, for the unknown that we cannot behold, filling the universe with wonder for the expanse of space itself that draws beyond the definitions of who we are as individuals. In the immensity of all that you have created, we thank you for setting each of us in communities. Communities that is our family who nurture what we become community of friends who love us by choice, for companions and co-workers who share our burdens and daily tasks, for strangers who welcome us into their midst out of the blue, for people from other lands who call us to grow in our understanding, children who lighten our moments with delight, and for the unborn who offer us hope for the future. Lord, we thank you for this day. One more opportunity to love. One more day to work for justice and peace. 
a day in which we can find one more person to love and by whom we will be loved. One more day to experience your grace and your presence. One more day to experience your promises that you are with us. You are our God. You give to us salvation and life. Lord, for these and all the blessings that come freely from you, we give you thanks, eternal and loving God. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. gathering at the table this morning, and we're going to talk a lot about the church and what the church is in my sermon. It's reminded of uh, something Paul says in the book of Galatians about a crisis that came at a, I guess you might say it was a church potluck. If you imagine it happened here at First Christian Baton Rouge, the church had some special visitors come to join in worship, and they decided to throw an appreciation meal for their visitors in the fellowship hall. Unfortunately, those special visitors were a little leery, weren't familiar with Louisiana customs and Louisiana food, so they decided to eat by themselves back in the youth building. 
The Apostle Peter was there. Rather than eating with everybody in the fellowship hall, he joined with the others back in the youth building. When the Apostle Paul saw that happen, he immediately threw a flag on the field. Something is not right here. Peter, you have been eating with everybody all along. Why are you now withdrawing away? It's very simple. In the ancient world, sitting down to table with someone else was a sign that you were in full fellowship with that person. It was unfortunate in the book of Galatians when Peter withdrew his presence from the others because it was a sign he was a little unsure of his relationship with other Gentile Christians. In the ancient world, beyond the intimacy of marriage, eating with another person was the next most intimate thing that people did together. For us, this table that we offer in worship, it is the culmination and it is the center of what it means for us to be a worshiping community. Whatever has been our relationship to one another this past week or over the past years, here we are reminded that we are a family gathered to share this very special meal together. This morning I invite you not to just look at me, to look at Corey as she prays as an elder. I invite you to look around the table, look around the room, to see one another, to see those who have gathered in other churches outside of this one, to see the names on the walls here that represent those who have gone before us, To see those who you might be reluctant to eat with otherwise, but because we are all the same at this table, we all join as one. And in humble thanks, let us give praise to God for the glorious work that He does every time we gather to share the bread in the cup. Let us join together now in prayer. Dear Lord, we ask that you still our minds and open our hearts as we come to this communion table today. Draw each one of us closer as we partake together the bread and the cup in grateful remembrance of your love and sacrifice for us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Following the meal, Jesus took a cup, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and drink. This cup is the cup of the new covenant, which is in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Let's take a few moments of quiet meditation as we prepare to hear the scriptures read to us.
2 Samuel 6, 1 through 5, and 12b through 19. David gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David and the people with him set out and went from Baal Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the Ark of God, and Ahio went in front of the Ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. It was told King David, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the Ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fat lane. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girdled with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought up the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have to give a compliment to my wife. Those were a lot of tough names in that. I'm sorry about that. Usually I save that for myself, but good job. You nailed them all. I'll be reading from the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 1. We're beginning a sermon series on this book this morning. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of His glorious grace that He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace that He lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, He has made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure that He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I begin this morning, I want to ask you a question. When, when you hear the word family, what image pops into your mind? What, what do you think of when you hear that word family? In my youth, growing up in the 1970s, the image was two parents and two and a half children. 
I don't know whatever happened to that poor half child. Poor, poor guy. But, but I grew up in a family of five children, so this image that we had, my family already didn't quite fit that picture exactly. But again, in the 1970s, that picture was undergoing a rapid revision that we all know about. Baby boomers and their emphasis on individuality and women pursuing work careers and a whole host of other cultural shifts that were going in. Many of those two-parent homes were breaking down to single parents and then recombining into blended families with step-parents. That had, of course, evolved from a different image of family from the post-World War II generation. Families often had three or four children, and that had evolved from another image. During the Great Depression, many sociologists would point out that there were a lot of broken families, children who were abandoned because of the economic desperation of that time. We hear that word family today, what do we think? Today we do have a, a lot of blended families, but in very different ways. Grandparents raising grandchildren, same-sex marriages, adoptions by choice, and adoptions when individuals and families are just thrown together. And then there's those millennials, those vexing millennials. Millennials have caused more troubles for church people than I can I can tell you. They, they don't go to church like they used to, and they have put off marriage longer than any other generation in the past has. You can try to put together some kind of a statistical model of what the average American family looks like today, but there are so many exceptions to the rules, it's hard to say what the family looks like. Growing up, I remember there were many Christians who complained about these changes that were happening in American families, blended families and the like. Remember the goal, it seemed, of James Dobson and focus on the family was to try to get everyone back to that standard of two parents who stay married until uh, death do they part and those two and a half children and anything else it seemed like was against God's will. Make no mistake, I'm an advocate for strong families. When families break down for any reason, inevitably that means human pain and suffering. But as Christians, I have to say, we really should do a lot better at supporting blended and non-traditional families because when you get right down to the root of it, that's what the church is, a blended family, one giant world-encompassing cosmic blended family. As I began this new sermon series on the book of Ephesians, the theme of this is a life shaped by worship. The book of Ephesians, I think, is a very interesting book to read in context of Paul's writings because most Bible students read this as a later letter that Paul wrote. If we go back to earlier letters that Paul wrote, we see Paul is dealing with a lot of Jewish and Gentile conflict within the church, and He's trying to keep some peace, trying to bring some factions together. But in this later phase in Paul's life, it looks like that earlier conflict is kind of softened up. Jews and Gentiles are figuring it out, what it means for us to be a community and a family together. And as the enmity between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians has faded away, there's a new voice that we begin to hear. A new voice that Paul uses, but Paul is echoing the voice of the church itself now. The voice of the church coming into her own, and that voice is a voice of praise and worship. 
The voice of the church over the years, it has been borrowed for all kinds of agendas. And I stand before you today to say it is time for Christ church to take her own voice back and use it for what it was meant for, giving praise to God. Amen, church? As Paul begins this letter, he touches on that old rift. Rift between Jews and Gentiles. And kind of like the, the scar on the, the back of my hand here, I don't know if you can see it very well, but I remember I was at, uh, at my parents' condo at the beach and I was heating something under the broiler and I, I reached in there and I lifted my hand just a little bit too high and the back of my hand touched the electric element. Man, that hurt like the dickens. It burnt deeply, but you know, it's healed. There's a scar there but it's healed. In the church, Paul can see that there's a scar. There's this old rift of Jewish and Gentile conflict, but it's now healed. And he points to that as he begins talking about what God has done for us. He says, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before Him in Love. And right there in that first opening sentence, we stumble into a mystery. Before the world came into being, God chose you for a special relationship. Now that is shocking. Because here's the thing that in the ancient world, the Jews believed that they were the ones entitled to that special relationship because they had been born to the right family. They were descendants of Abraham. Gentiles, on the other hand, I think we could generically say that they thought God chose only those who were worthy of relationship, those who had glorified themselves in some way, perhaps in battle. Those were the ones that God chose for special relationships. But Paul says, no, it's, it's, not, no, it's not who you were born to. It's not what you've done. Before the foundation of the world, before any of us even knew how to ask for it, God chose us to be loved. I remember in my third grade class, there was another little girl in there that I thought she was pretty cute. And I kind of liked her. And, and she kind of liked me back, too. I, I was kind of new in that classroom, and she thought I was kind of cute. As much as little children at that age don't really know how to talk about their feelings face to face, we, we did the next best, best thing. We, we wrote notes. You remember those third grade notes being passed around, those little folded up sheets that you passed while the teacher wasn't looking? And, and there was a list of questions that she wrote to me. Do you like me? Do you want to hold my hand? Do you love me? And out to the left or to the right of each of those questions were, were two little boxes, and I was supposed to, as George Strait famously sang, check yes or no. You remember those notes? You remember those? None of us ever had the chance to pass that note to God to ask whether or not God loved us in order to secure that love. God already loved us before any of us knew how to ask. I think this is similar to the experience that expectant or new parents have with this child. Before that child is born, before that child knows anything other than crying or being hungry or needing a diaper change, before that child knows how to give hugs and kisses, the parents love that child deeply. So with us, before any of us knew we needed to be loved by God, God already loved us from the foundation of the world itself. 
It's not just the Jews who could lay claim to God's love by birth. It's not Gentiles who prove their manliness and worthiness. These aliens and these strangers, these foreigners to one another, they have crossed over together into God's kingdom. And that crossing over was not a mistake. It was not a plan B on God's part. They weren't just thrown together against God's will. It was fundamentally by God's design. And what a design it was. Paul recounts all that God has done very quickly in this opening passage to provide for this family. God destined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ. We have redemption and forgiveness through Christ's blood. God has made known to us the mystery of His will as a plan to gather up all things. We look around at our world and things seem random and scattered, but no, God has a plan to pull all things together. In Christ, we have attained an inheritance. And as a promise of that future inheritance, that future glory coming to us because we are all children of God, God has already given us a down payment. God has given us and sealed us with the Holy Spirit. Now, I look at that list. I'm a preacher and I'm a worship leader. And each one of those things is a sermon and a hymn by itself. You know what I mean? We're redeemed by the blood. We have the Spirit within us. We have an inheritance coming. We have redemption and forgiveness. This is the worship of the church in a bullet list. That's because all of these are exactly that for Paul. This is the worship of the church being sounded aloud. These are the phrases that the church used week in and week out as they gathered together. Interwoven with each of these things God has done, Paul responds with words of, fra- pr- words of praise. He begins, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says our adoption as God's children is to the, His glorious grace that He freely bestowed on us. He says we who were first to set our hope on Christ, we might live for the praise of His glory. And the Holy Spirit that has been given to us, that also is to the praise of God's glory. All of this happens in this crazy, mixed up family that God has called together and worship and glorifying God becomes the glue that holds us. The glue that makes us one. That story we heard about King David You have to listen to it closely, what's going on there. David has been crowned king of Israel. All the elders agreed they want David to be their ruler. But as he decides to set up the temple in Jerusalem, and he brings the ark of God into the temple, you see David do something very humbling. Now, he is king. He's supposed to be majestic. He's supposed to make others, people, fearful of him. What does he do? He strips down to a linen ephod, which is just a thin linen robe, and he begins dancing around like a nutcase, all his might, throwing his arms in the air. Other accounts of this say he was dancing with the women He wasn't even staying, he was back there with all the women, dancing with all his might. And Queen Michael, his wife, looks out and sees his husband acting the fool in front of everybody. And what does she do? She despises him. What a nutcase. What what is he doing? He's making a fool of himself. But in making a fool of himself, what he says to his people, it is the worship of God that holds us together. It's not me. It's not my power. 
It's not how I'm going to make others fear. It is the worship of God that is going to hold this together. Look around this room. I invite you now, look around here. This past week was the anniversary, eighth, eighth anniversary of my call to this congregation. When I started in this congregation, I was warned, David, be careful who you talk about because everybody is related to somebody else. It took me a couple years to figure out, but this whole related system comes down to Pam Como. <laughs> Pam has more relations in this church than anybody I know of. It takes a whole chart and a wall and markers to figure out how she's related here. But the thing is, there's a lot of us, like myself, we're not related to Pam Como. We're a blended family here, believe it or not. Many different families gather together. But you ask what it is that is the center of, our worship, center of our community, it is that we gather in worship together. That is the center of our identity. More than just that, one of the great things I love about the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, we have a very ecumenical outlook. We look around at other churches, and it doesn't matter what sign they hang on the door. We look at them as brothers and sisters. We are part of this great cosmic family that has pulled us together. And what is it that unites us? It is our worship of God. And you look at that family, and that family grows immensely and diversely very quickly, just right here in the Baton Rouge area. And we continuing continue looking outward and that family, the family of Christ, the church itself, speaks many languages, dresses differently, doesn't respect political boundaries, couldn't care less about the color of your skin, your education, or your income. The, the church of Christ is much larger than who we are in our little atomic groups. And you ask yourself, how is it that God can get so many different people on the same page together? What is the glue that holds this great cosmic group together? In Ephesians, it comes down to one thing, this great, crazy blended family that God has created. We are a people of worship. And humble thankfulness for what God has done. COVID in this past almost year and a half, it, it's been a challenge at times for worship in church, but it never stopped us. Even if we couldn't gather in person, we gathered virtually because worship is the center of our identity and we figure it out by hook or by crook, we're going to keep our worship going. This is what we do together. Our lives are literally shaped by the worship we do together. And the one little detail that I've neglected to mention about this amazing book is that as Paul is writing it and speaking in these high words of praise, his hands are in chains. He writes this entire book from a dank prison cell. And he still praises God, the God who in some ways is responsible for Paul sitting in jail, Paul looks at all that God has done in Christ and he says, that alone outweighs any of my personal challenges. I will praise the Lord. That's a lesson for us to learn right there. Whatever our personal challenges, what God has done is so much greater. Let us praise the Lord. Church, I ask you this morning, have you found that kind of worship in your lives together? Will you make worshiping together a priority? As I stand before you this morning, I, I got a lot going on in my soul. I've been reflecting on ministry and I've come to believe that ministry is, as it's 
exercise today, it's kind of a strange business. When people change jobs and make a move across the country and start with a new employer somewhere, you start that new job with the expectation that you're going to go into this workplace and you just want them to respect you as an employee, to pay you what you do, to give you your weekends off, treat you like a good employee. Eight years ago this past week, you invited me to come into this community and to be more than employee for you. You asked me to be part of your family. And I asked you to be part of my family. And you welcomed me in. I was a kid from Kansas. From time to time, I've heard some of you call me a Yankee. I hadn't spent more than 48 hours in Louisiana at the time. I had only passed through Baton Rouge one time on my way to New Orleans. And yet you called me here and you said, let's be family together. And I asked myself, how, how did that work? Why was it? How was it that I was welcomed into this family? It is that our lives have been shaped by the worship of a God who loved, loved us before we were born, loved and redeemed us and forgave us and was the first to welcome us in. That's how it happened. What we do here on Sunday mornings, what we do when we gather in worship to God, it, it's not just a cafeteria offering. Well, here's one more amongst a thing, a range of things that, that you do. As Christ Church welcomes all who come in faith, may God's praise be eternally upon our lips. Amen and amen. As we prepare to close this time of worship, I ask that we would stand and sing together. In Christ there is no east or west. Please rise as you are able. In Christ there is couple of quick reminders as we close. Please remember if we got some strong arms and backs that could gather together in the fellowship hall. I uh, want to see if we can uh, figure out uh, a little bit of what's happening under the kitchen island in there. Uh, please remember uh, for your giving options at First Christian Church, uh, there are offering plates at each of our exits. If you go to our website, fccbrla.org, there you will find a button that will take you to our giving options. 
Uh, Sunday School will meet, uh, Zoom information for those of you uh, joining us on live stream. Uh, the Zoom information went out via email yesterday. Uh, please, if you're here in person, join together in the church library. Uh, with those final announcements given, let us uh, sing our closing refrain, close with our benediction. Peace be upon you and guard you forever. Go out and share God's secret purpose which has been disclosed to us in Jesus Christ. Share that secret with others by the way that you live together. With words of worship on your lips, the confidence of being a beloved child, with the resources of a lasting and internal, eternal inheritance and a vision to draw all lives together in unity. The grace of Christ has redeemed you. The enduring love of God supports you. The friendship of the Holy Spirit sealed within you will accompany you this day and evermore. Amen.